My name is Mary O'Leary and I'm an English and Irish teacher from Cork. All my life I've been immersed in the Irish traditional music and culture, going to flas and slogas and scores and singing the night away. At these festivals and flas, the focus is always firmly on the musicians who enthrall their audiences with their skill and talent. But today, I want to pull back the curtain and take a glimpse at the lives of those all too forgotten alchemists who make the music possible. Let me take you on the journey of the instrument maker. actually wondering how viable it is to make instruments in this modern day world of mass production and e-commerce. So I'm here at Sheena Crowley's home today to ask her that very question. Sheena, thanks a million for having me. No bother. Um, you're not an instrument maker yourself, Sheena, but can you tell me a little bit about your connection with the trade? My grandfather, um, Ty Crowley, was a pipe major and composer and instrument maker, so uh, he set up a music shop. Uh, 1923 Crowley's Music Centre um, which closed unfortunately but um, when he was a young man uh, he had a lathe in his kitchen you know and himself and his brother used to make instruments and things like that and he used to travel around Munster uh, fixing and repairing instruments in marching band schools and so on and then he saw it an, an industry that he wanted to um, market it to the world like so he used to be making pipes and marching instruments and shipping them around the world. So that's the original connection, really, my grandfather, you know. Fantastic. And your father, too, then, continued yeah. that tradition. Yeah, my da my grandfather died in 1955, and my father took over at the age of 14, and he was always really handy fixing things. People used to go to him from everywhere with everything to fix, you know. So um, you recognise it in him, like, you know that he's going to solve any problem, really, and he could fix anybody's instrument. But about five years before he died, he started making instruments himself. He started making banjos and... Um, making flutes and things like that and he was really getting into that unfortunately he passed away without having made too many but uh, he loved it but we also set up a workshop after he passed away downstairs as a separate entity from the shop you know I wanted to kind of realise my grandfather's dream really and um, I was always involved with people who were making instruments and I love it myself I'd tip away at making things but never really fully uh, making a, a full instrument such I'd make the neck of a guitar or I'd bend the sides for the lads or something like that and I'd be involved like I suppose I'd say it is certainly a thing to be said that you know Crowley's is a great loss to anyone who who lived or ever lived in Cork City yeah. and I'm sure there's many memories you yeah. have but is there what is the most resounding memory or what you miss the most about the shop everything um I loved it obviously you know I grew up in it and it was my I had kind of I had freedom being in that place and I remember saying to my friends on Sunday night, they were always complaining about going to work on the Monday morning and I was happy out and they were saying, what's going on there? And I said, I love going to work, you know, I just love it. But um, what probably is the biggest loss to me is the people. I miss them an awful lot. Like, I mean, I could feel emotional about that, but I'll see them again, I know. But, and I, you know, it was this central hub where people from any background of traditional music or rock music, it didn't matter what it was, so we could meet everybody, you know. So we got this passage, continuous passage of great people like so. Um, that's the thing you'd miss the most. I do miss the instruments, of course, as well. You have an you have an in depth understanding, definitely. And just wondering, what exactly would you think is the difference between a handcrafted instrument and one that is mass produced? Um, I personally think it's an awful lot to do with the energy of the maker, which might sound a bit strange. But if you open up an instrument that has been handmade for somebody especially and you open up take it out of the case you feel it you can actually physically feel something do you think there is a future for irish instrument makers well i certainly hope so and there should be because i mean ireland is all about that's our history you know we've come from centuries of incredible makers and i know that people like dante and uh, vincenzo galilei they all commented on the, you know the makers of ireland and how famous they were and that's up to the 17th century that's incredible uh, renowned skill that we had you know um, today you've got St John's College in, uh, in Limerick the University in Limerick and there's a, a course in Dublin of instrument making so 
I'm sure there will be a great future, but I do think that the government needs to assist and support them in any way they can. And I was thinking that maybe somebody like Quilter, I don't know, they've got 400,000 400, hectares of land, like which could be used in a certain way to have a crop tree that could be used for some instrument making, like the cherry, Fantastic, the yeah. apple, walnut, etc. You know, apart from the hardwoods, you know, a lot of hardwoods are being imported from um, places now, and they're becoming more endangered species and things like that. So there is something to be looked at, but I do think the craftsmen in Ireland. There's so many of them, like you know, and they're so uh, talented, and I think it definitely should be something that uh, should be assisted, like in any way possible. I'm here outside St John's College on Sawmill Street. And I'm here today to meet a man by the name of Declan Young. And Declan's been teaching instrument making here for many a year. So let's go in and have a chat and see what Declan has to say about the tricks of the trade. So tell me a little bit about what sparked your interest in instrument making. Well, it came from playing. I, I've been playing since I was about 15. And just like every other guitar player, I did you know, running repairs on my own instruments. And um, when I was living in London, a friend of mine had studied at the London College of Furniture, and uh, he was singing the praises of the, place, of the place and said, oh, you should, you know, definitely look into this. So um, it went on from repairing my own instruments to going to college to learn how to do it. Fantastic. And how many years have you been here now in St. John's? I've been here since 95, but the musical instrument making course has been running for the last nine years. What is your opinion of the future of instrument makers in, in, in this, I suppose, modern day world of mass production and e-commerce? Well, it's, it's, always, it's always going to be difficult when you're competing with um, mass produced instruments. And the area that you're hoping to get into is maybe high-end, making high-end guitars for people who can afford that, or maybe working as a guitar tech, you know, with a band, a travelling band. Um, that's probably what people would aim for. And being an instrument ma maker yourself, what is it like being an instrument maker in Cork here? Um, Cork is good because there's a lot of live music played here. And Ireland in general, I would say, is good because I'd say there are very few households in the country that don't have a musical instrument. And all of these need to be maintained, repaired, and for the, for the musical instrument maker, or the person who starts off to, to learn musical instrument making, uh, for the most part, the bread and butter work will be repairs and setups and things like that, you know? So do you mind just uh, maybe showing me a few pieces of your work? Yeah, not at all. Pleasure. I'm fascinated about this guitar you have. Tell me a little bit about the sound of all that. If you tap the top of the guitar, you'll see that a lot of response there. But when you get up to what's called the upper bout, which is this part of the guitar, they're kind of acoustically dead spots. So if you take the sound hole from here and put it up in a dead spot, 
it has uh, the huge advantage of letting all of the top here vibrate. Gives you a greater resonance, greater volume, incredible volume for the size of the guitar. And also, if you're playing in sessions and so on, you can actually hear the sound of the guitar because it acts a little bit like a monitor as well. You can hear oh. it better than you would if it's down here. And you have another guitar behind you, um, which is another fascinating story. Can you tell us just a little bit about that one? Yeah, um, this one is made out of all recycled materials. Um, I was around at a friend's house and he said, I've got these mahogany doors that I have no use for. Can you do anything with them? So I had a look at them and I saw that they were thick enough to be deep cut and cut into book matched pieces for the top of a, a guitar and for the back of a guitar. And I also got the sides out of it. So having started the guitar using recycled material, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to see if I could make the entire guitar out of recycled material? So everything that you see there, with the exception, say, of the machine heads, the frets and the strings, all came out of other of pieces of furniture, in fact. And how many years now would you say did it take to get to this calibre of work and design in the guitar, in the, in the making of the guitars? I suppose really since I took up working with timber. It's not where I started out. Mm -hmm. um, originally I studied analytical chemistry out in CIT in Rossa Avenue and uh, I worked in the education system in London. But um, I found that it wasn't really satisfying me that much in that there was no kind of tangible result at the end of my day's work. And this um, making, making instruments, making furniture, but making instruments specifically, I find that very rewarding in this sense. Though Cork is a small population, it has a vibrant musical landscape. It's got trad sessions every night of the week. It's also host to the Jazz Festival, the Choral Festival, the Folk Festival and many more. I'm here today to drop into Bertrand Galin's studio, a luthier from France who's now living here. So Bertrand, thanks so much for inviting me into your workshop today. I know you're a busy man. Um, Cork is such a vibrant city. Do you have lots of different clients coming to you here? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I just uh, don't get choosy. I take what comes. And anyway, there's always some interest in any instrument. So the idea is that my job is to take care of the instrument and, uh, if possible, improve its state. Usually when people come, there's something that needs to be done. Mm. It can be only just uh, just just uh, you know clean up and stuff, but it can be also a lot of the time they expect me to improve the instrument, mm -hmm. and that you can do on any given instrument, from the cheapest, tiniest to the best instruments. So I do that. Uh, I do that for for everybody. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, to uh, to check a bit. Uh, like I've done. A a good setup on this instrument I change a few things and uh, usually it takes a while to to uh, settle there's all those tension involved the strings are stretching when they're new the bridge uh, might make the sound a bit harsh and uh, and then make the new sound post as well so uh, this little piece of wood there that connect the front and the back so the idea is to uh, to, to try the whole range to see how it responds, if it's quick to respond, if it's easy to, to play, if I can, if I can play in uh, a lot of different situations uh, is, as easily and uh, how it can take the pressure and all that. So, so I'll just play notes, that's nothing to do with music. Thank you. 
you're busy working away there. Yeah, I'm starting to work on a cello. Uh, well, I'm starting on the scroll of a cello. And uh, that will be for nobody, actually. I just made it for fun. Well, this is uh, amazing work as well. Yeah. Been working on this type of uh, model. It's all the... There's, there's, uh, there's model, there's uh, difficulties to make very low arching, very low um, uh, volumes like that, that blends very well, that's, uh, that's a tricky one, but that's what I'm working at. Uh, the, last time, the last time we were talking, we were in your workshop where you do mainly repairs, and here's where you actually make the instruments in your studio at home. Yes, I, I decided to separate both because uh, they need a different frame of mind. Uh, this is uh, more creative in a sense because you have to uh, you have to really use your senses a lot. She's more mainly visual and acoustic uh, at some stage, and uh, repairing is more is more technical. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, also acoustic, but the the, the whole uh, the whole core of the work is uh, is uh, is uh, is technical. We're down here in Glanworth to speak to a very diverse and interesting instrument maker, Mr. John Reed from Kilmaley County Clare. John, I've known you a long time and it's very rarely I've seen you without the pipes in your hands. And how did you go down the road into instrument making? My father was a tool maker and the reason I know to make pipes and flutes is like some, some young fellows might be farmers and they, they would have been they would have been educated in above in tractors and stuff like but like with me basically it was like there was workshops there since I was twelve, so you know, you'd be filing or walking and drilling machines and stuff, so it, it's there, you know. And, and what prompted you then, John, to go into the making of pipes? When Eugene made the pipes for my father, you know, for for me, you know, um I got a connection with Eugene, so Eugene Lem he's, he's a pipe maker up in Clare, and he showed me about gun drilling, about reamers, but he would have shown Techniques about, like um, when you're when you're soldering, like what you what you have to do with, and, and how to handle acid. You need that for for etching and like and stuff. And what exactly is it you love about instrument making? Because I know you were engineering before, and you sidelined into this. So, generally speaking, engineers don't actually get to make anything themselves. You know, they they design to a point, and they have all the tools to design to a point, but they don't actually get to um, make something and see it that it's going to be there in 200 years time.
I'm absolutely blown away by the work that I see, the precision and the finesse that these instrument makers use, the care and attention that they give to their work. It's almost impossible for me now to look on these instruments as mere products. I have to say I can only look at them as works of art. And I'm here today in the Sample Studios in the Old Falls building to talk to a very talented sculptor and instrument maker, Tal Gallet. Tell me a little bit how you started playing. How I started playing music? Yeah. Oh, I started when I was a young fella. Um, growing up in Canada, my, my parents were big into the, into the cultists. Um, grew up with trad, and, uh, sitting under pipe players, you know. Um, my mum's a, a, a violinist, my dad plays the guitar and the flute. Um, yeah, music was in the house all my life, like, so. And you also are famed for wide in Cork for being a sculptor. And are, do the two marry well? Oh, they do. I mean, again, you know, the, the two went hand in hand. Uh, both my parents are artists as well. So, yeah, my father's a, a stone sculptor, my mother's a painter. Um, so, yeah, it was art and music all the way. And how did you go down the road into instrument making? Um, that's, that's, that's kind of, um, can happen by chance, really. Um, it was, sculpture was always my thing. Um, but uh, I kind of learned a bit too late that uh, you can't really use your hands as hammers. And uh, I kind of ruined my wrists doing it, so I had to go find uh, some kind of easier kind of work on the hands and it kind of just landed in, in, the, in the instrument making by mistake, really. So what would be unique then about your own pieces? I think I approach them from a very kind of sculptural point of view. Um, I kind of, uh, I think it's lo looking at the timbers, uh, looking at the shapes of the things. Um, and you're also very kind of tied down by, um, you know, they're, 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 you're very, very strict in the way that you, that you have to build it in order for it to work, which suits me nicely as well, you know. Um, I find sculpture, you can often kind of uh, get a bit carried away. It can be a bit, um, there's, I think I like having a, having a base of something to work from, like, you know, uh, something practical. So is Cork a good place to be an instrument maker? Uh, instrument maker, I'm not so sure. Um, certainly the, the approach I'm taking from, from a more kind of sculptural thing, uh, you know, you can't compete with the factories. Um, they, they wind up expensive. It's, it's a fairly limited kind of a, a market for it. It's, it's repairs is what the business is, really. And uh, is that frustrating at times? Would you prefer to be uh, making instruments all the time? Oh, I would, of course, yeah. Um, but, you know, you... you, you, you it's, it's, it's a different thing. I've, I've always liked tinkering and, and, you know, trying to figure things out as well. Like, you know, it can be challenging enough trying to, trying to find a problem in, a, in an instrument, you know, and, and figure a way of, of, of making it work, you know. So, Tal, this is what I, I knew you for first as a sculptor. This is just amazing. I mean, how many hours or years of labour has gone into this? I really couldn't tell you. Um, yeah, I probably started that nearly 20 years ago. This piece as well behind you. Um, tell me how, how you got inspired for this one. It's it's just what it looked like. It was um, it was a plank. It was a, it was a rough sound plank, and I was looking at it, and it it looked just like a mermaid. So that's what I did with this. So it's it's kind of the way I usually go with my sculptures. You just stare at the piece of wood until you see a picture in it, and you and you go for that, like you know. Uh, do you miss the, the sculpture now, or does the instrument making fill the void? Or? Oh, the instrument making. I think I'm more interested in. You know, I mean. I mean, for, for an artist, I uh, I never really had a huge interest in art. Um, I was never one for going to exhibitions and that. Like you know, I I enjoy the work. It's uh, it's kind of a solitary kind of thing for me. It's I think it's the tedium that I go for. You know, um, I kind of kind of find it's sort of a meditation in it. You know.
Well, my journey on the instrument making scene in Cork has come to an end. I've met so many great people and found out a lot of new and fascinating things. Each instrument maker I met seemed genuinely enthusiastic and passionate about music and their craft. Although each found their route towards this career path in a different way, they all seem to derive great pleasure from their work. All the makers I met also do maintenance and repair, and it seems to be part of the same larger job, to make, maintain, and thereby improve the music. They each seem to really enjoy the challenges at play with the different parts of their job. So while it is not easy to make a living as an instrument maker, it is really a worthwhile pursuit. It's wonderful to see that after all these centuries, that these skills have not been lost. I really enjoy getting to know something more about the role of the instrument maker, for it is one which I believe enriches this country, promoting, improving and facilitating Ireland's incredible culture of music. Now, let's hear the lads play one more time.